Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shop Talk, hosted by the Triangle Area SQL Server User Group. So, as always, we have with us Mala. How you doing, Mala? Good evening, everyone. And unfortunately, Mike is in uh, Scotland right now. I believe he is currently fomenting rebellion against the English. Um, <laughs> and Tracy, I believe, was hired as a privateer working for the English. So we'll see how that shakes out. So if this is your first time here, welcome to Shop Talk. The idea is it's Monday, at least on the East Coast. It's, it's after work time. Uh, kick back your heels and talk a little bit about some technical topics, a little database stuff. If you have any questions, anything you want Mala and me to talk about, throw them in chat. This is a chat-driven show. Andrews is currently storm prepping. Yeah, you're out on, on <laughs> Easter Coast, uh, further on the East Coast, so where where the grounds are flat and uh, it's still storm season. So. Uh, Hopefully everything is okay out there, Anders. All right, couple of topics for tonight, and one of them, um, I'm gonna certify it right now as a barn burner. You may think you're gonna derail me, but when we get to this topic, Anders, uh, this is gonna be a morass, I, I guarantee it. But before we get to that topic, a uh, couple of notes, one of them, in it hasn't come out yet. It'll come out soon. But Mike is, is actually going to be a guest on the SQL Data Partners podcast. So uh, Carlos Eugene and I interviewed him not too long ago. And I learned a couple of things, such as I've been mispronouncing Mike Christensen's last name for this last several years. And he has never corrected me. He's never once taken me aside and said, hey, you know, my name is actually spelled or pronounced that way. And I was I, like, OK. I'm glad that I learned this now rather than three years ago. So I'm going to have to um, point point that out to Mike when he's next on the air here. As so, what? How do you say? What's the right way to say his last name, Kevin? It's actually pronounced like Christensen as opposed to Christensen. Okay, I won't even try that. Yeah, it's it's like an I instead of an E, so Christensen. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's Mike's last name. The the more you know. Um, mm -hmm. Also, should have asked a Norwegian. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe. But uh, but then, I know how to pronounce your name, Anders. So and knowing that that's not the Norwegian way to pronounce it, <laughs> you know, things weird things happen um, on that way to America. <laughs> now, while that. Uh, podcast was airing. Uh, actually, we we organized it. We said, okay, we're going to do it on a Monday at this time. And I said, yeah, yeah, that sounds perfectly fine. And then I realized that, oh, wait, that's when I was getting my car inspected. So I ended up being at a car dealership waiting for my car to get uh, fixed up during that entire interview, which means there was actually a stretch on there where I thought that they were done with my car and I was paying and it turns out I was actually paying for somebody else's uh, work and they're like here's your keys and I said wait where's the rest of my keys uh, I don't know that's weird that maybe it's in your car and I get the details and um, it's for a Mazda 3 I'm like I, don't, I didn't bring a Mazda 3 here I brought an MX-5 I brought a Miata <laughs> Like, wait, you're not Mr. Whoever? Like, no, no. Well, I thought you were Mr. Whoever. I'm on the I'm on a conference call. You know, I'm, I'm actually on a call. You came over, waved me over, told me that my car was done. Uh, apparently, my car wasn't done. Now, the real kicker, uh, I she when she told me the price, I, I was internally thinking, ooh, that's a lot of money for an oil change and inspection. By the time I was done, I ended up paying basically that same amount of money because I needed my brakes done. So... Um, all of that was happening while I was essentially debating, Mike. Uh, it's gonna, I'll give you a hint. The topic is generative AI. We talk a lot about that in the episode. So check that out on your favorite podcast listener. Now, um, unless he's Swedish, yeah, that would, that would also throw a wrench in things uh, pronunciation-wise. So I'm going to jump past the next topic and we're going to go straight into uh, the derailment, which I believe, let me, 
let me see what the best way is that I can share this screen. So I'm gonna switch us very quickly. By the way, TriPass elections are coming up soon and TriPass wants you. So um, we are going to um, go to another round of elections. They're coming up. Uh, I sent out an email to all TriPass users and we're gonna get to that election cycle coming up in just a couple of months. So if you're interested in running for one of the two open board, well, quasi open board positions, because Mike and Tracy, uh, as far as I'm aware, are running again. But if you're interested, talk to me. Send me a message at Meetup, send me an email, uh, send me some details, and we can set up a proper vote because to date, we've never actually had a vote. Um, it's always been essentially, yeah, you know what, uh, that, that works. We're just gonna have the people who are selected. Now, I'm going to blank out the screen real quick so that I can share and share and I'm gonna bring the screen right back. That's almost classy and professional. It's not quite classy and professional, but it's, it's getting there. Um, this is a SQL style guide. So this originally was from, uh, I saw it in Brent Ozar's newsletter last week. Mala saw uh, somebody tweet about it. And we are gonna talk a bit about this guide because as I was going through it, I'm gonna give you my spoilers. I agree with about half of it. I vehemently disagree with about a quarter of it. And I kind of disagree with a quarter of it. So, um, it should be interesting, and I expect that we're going to get some um, holy wars in chat, is my expectation. But let's start at the top. Uh, these guidelines are designed to be compatible with Joe Selko's book. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, I have no problem with Joe Selko, the man. Uh, I think he is a very smart guy. I think he has written very, uh, he's written great books. Yeah. I don't care for his programming style. Um, so you've already lost me in this sentence. Uh, nonetheless. I haven't read that book that, that he's referring to. I like other books that Joe has, although, you know, I mean, I have seen I've seen Joe heckled a lot for some things he said that were extremely unpopular back in the days. So oh sure, he he's yeah. very good at at um, getting being controversial. I think is is a great way of putting it. He is great at being controversial. Right. right. He is hilarious. So let's get on with this. Yeah. <laughs> it's hilarious to ask how you do something in SQL to him. Yeah, I imagine so. I imagine he's all it's all it's SQL. Pronounce it right, noob. Um, okay. Use consistent descriptive identifiers and names. All right. I'll, I'll give you that. Judicious use of white space and indentation. Yes. Even though I'm going to disagree with what he considers judicious. Store uh, ISO compliant date and time information. Yeah. I mean, use date and time t data types as appropriate. Um, he is opinionated even for a DBA. That's a really good way to put it, Anders. Uh, that, that is a really good way to put it. And he's not a DBA. Um, so He's not a DBA. That's the whole point. Correct. Uh, so keep so try to use only standard SQL functions instead of vendor-specific functions for reasons of portability. I start disagreeing with this point. So here's my, here's my counter argument. The whole reason for that is, oh, it's portable. I can move from SQL Server to Oracle to MySQL to Postgres to whatever flavor of the month I want. The problem is, how often do you do that? And the, the other problem is, if you're doing that often, why do you still work there? Because that sounds like a really horrible way to spend your time, especially when vendor-specific implementations of, of, prob, of solutions can be faster, can be more efficient, can be easier to read, can be easier to understand than the SQL standard. So and yeah, portability. What, what, what if your what if your code actually needs something that is custom to that particular flavor of SQL, 
And yeah, for are sure. Are going to not use it? Not use it? Right. Like, let me just give you a quick yeah. example. Does that mean never use the apply operator? No, that's that'd be dumb. You're, uh, you are purposefully handicapping yourself for what I agree with Anders is uh, one of the biggest myths in IT. You're probably not going to make that migration, and if you do make that migration, it is going to be very painful regardless of whether you're trying to use only standard SQL functions because you'll find out pretty quickly. Even if you use the same SQL syntax, then you may still have, well, this performance is awful in this new system. And the answer is, oh, well, it's because of the way that you're laying out files, the way that you're indexing, that like you're using SQL Server style indexing and you're on an Oracle system or you have expectations of SQL Server style indexing and those don't exist in Oracle. It's a completely different indexing strategy. And so, so you're I writing think your question. interesting why he says functions, Kevin, or is that just a generic term to any kind of SQL syntax um, that may be specific? Why is he saying functions then? Because he's so he's probably thinking about things like uh, use concat or sorry, not concat, use um, coalesce instead of is null. Basically, no, yeah, are, that's what I get. But uh, like but the functions. example you gave, apply is not a function, but apply is a function oh okay apply apply actually applies a function to every row in a uh, iterative set okay oh goodness i didn't think of it that way at all okay yeah but mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. so i mm -hmm. assume that the function bit the function bit is because most of the time the differences are in functions versus implementations of oh, yeah, yeah. other terms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I don't agree with that one. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that's, that's one I, my, I moderately disagree with. I won't say that that's, I strongly. That's classic joke for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Keep codes uh, succinct and devoid of redundant SQL, like unnecessary quoting or parentheses or where clauses that can otherwise be derived. I'm, mostly in favor of this. There actually are cases where I want explicitly an aware clause, something that I as a human know can be derived, but the optimizer is having trouble finding it. I have seen cases, especially in more complex queries, where I can naturally infer that if A is equal to something and B is equal to something, then C is equal to this function of A and B, but that it doesn't help the optimizer until I specifically say, and C equals blah, 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 because that allows some index to get picked up and perform a seek operation instead of a scan, or it allows uh, some sort of maybe a prefetch operation, maybe it reorganizes the way in which the tables are read, the order in which tables are read for the query plan. So in those cases, I will add what you would consider to be a redundant clause. I would also put a comment on there, which actually is the next the next point. But I would put a comment on there and say, yeah, this is explicitly added for performance optimization. Mm -hmm. uh, Solomon Fair says, enough. not taking advantage of vendor specific functionality is at best insane and at worst might prevent optimal completion of a project. For sure. Sorry, Mala, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I said so far, I'm completely with you. Agree. Um, okay. Include comments in SQL code where necessary. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've gotten a little bit less comment heavy over the time. Um, but basically, if I can explain a why, if there's a why that I think needs to be explained, then yes, that's important to do. Use C style comments where possible. Otherwise, use the dash style um, C style comments, the slash star is actually better. And the reason is, um, it has to do with things like reading dynamic SQL, printing out dynamic SQL and the way that new lines get written and how, uh, with, depending on how you build that dynamic SQL, you may not have a new line. And so that comment may actually comment out the entire rest of your query, which is, a part of how um, SQL injection can be used. So you're using that comment to basically say, ignore the rest of the query that you expect to, to have run here. 
<laughs> copy code out of Century One once and you'll never do hyphen hyphen again. Yeah. Uh, and comments, explain intent, don't document. I agree. All right. So we've gotten through that. The do's, uh, it's like 50-50. Some of them, yeah, fully agree. Some of them, no, strongly disagree. Avoid camel case. Strong disagree. Uh, so he's pushing the underscore notation. I don't like the underscore notation for I, a couple that's of reasons. What I, that I do like too, yeah. Yeah, the, the snake case. Um, <laughs> snake case is fairly readable, but it is much harder to type. It is much easier to have typos. It is really easy to accidentally strike a hyphen rather than an underscore. And camel case, saying that it's difficult to scan quickly, I disagree with that. The point, the, the place where I can understand that argument is in cases where you have multiple capital letters in a row. <laughs> SP underscore Anders deletes all your data. Oh, wait till we get to the next article, if we get to the next article. <laughs> um, there, there is a, there's a tie in there. But I do prefer camel, camel case rather than uh, snake case. Do not use descriptive prefixes or Hungarian notation like SP underscore or tibble. Yeah, fully agree with that. Plurals. Use the more natural collective term where possible instead. Uh, for example, staff instead of employees or people instead of individuals. No, no, I... Okay couple of problems that I have with this. Number one, I don't like pluralized tables. I, I like a table as an entity, and I think of an employee instead of the employees. Secondly, this gets into trouble when you have people who uh, don't speak English as a first language mm -hmm. and might find ambiguity at a term like staff. Like what's in, a, what's in the staff table? Oh, well, obviously, it's all of the different staffs that the ninjas use. Kevin is not set-based. Uh, no, just based. Um, peoples. Peoples is a perfectly cromulent word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, peoples is a word. It's funny how many people don't know that. Yep. And, but, but essentially, yeah, I don't, I don't like... Uh, I don't like pluralizing table names. I prefer pluralizing concepts. You have a you have a set of employees, but each one is an employee. My favorite mm -hmm. table of all time is table. Not even TBL underscore table. Uh, quoted identifiers, if you must use them, don't use them. I essentially agree with this. Avoid quoted identifiers. And object-oriented design principles should not be applied to SQL or database structures. Fully agree here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is something that a lot of developers get themselves in trouble with because uh, you, you want to have that database style match as closely as possible to your application code as a developer. And so you think of the database in object-oriented terms, and it, do it never works out very well because relational algebra and object orientation are quite different. They they do not align. Mm -hmm. So the autumn folks need to hear it. <laughs> SQL or relational database structures? Uh, relational. I mean, it's it's relational algebra at the end of the day, and that's going to be radically different from the uh, type of concepts that you would drive at with object orientation. I mean, this is where I would toot the horn of functional programming because lambda calculus and relational algebra or set theory actually do align really well. Joe's stuff was written decades before NoSQL DBs. Yeah, but Joe's stuff was also written in the days of um, IBM file-based databases. Uh, yes, object-oriented databases didn't exist. Well... No, Joe wrote a bunch of books in the 90s. I mean, your first object-oriented databases came out in the 90s. They were awful because object-oriented databases tend to be awful, but they did exist. And even you know, before relational databases, you had hierarchical and network databases. 
which, uh, hot take, NoSQL is basically a hierarchical database. Just like the cloud is really a mainframe. Basically, it's people trying to drag us back into the 70s. Um, but hot take over. So uh, the stuff to avoid, I agree with half of the stuff. Yeah, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, I agree with half of the avoids. I d strongly disagree with one of the avoids. I moderately disagree with one of the avoids. Uh, naming conventions. Ensure the name is unique. It does not exist as a reserved keyword. For the most part. The, the problem is that there are things like, you know, what is your login to the system? Well, login is a reserved keyword, so I need to use some other term. But if login is the appropriate term to use, or password, like if we're if we're storing, granted, I could say this is password hash. But mm -hmm. there are cases where this can be difficult. I have to wrap everything in brackets. Yeah, this is that is the pain. So that's why I mostly agree with avoiding reserved keywords as much as possible. Now, keep the length to a maximum of 30 bytes. Uh, first of all, I didn't know that we were working on DB2. Second of all, this, a SQL Server sysname is invarchar128, and I'm going to get all of my money out of invarchar128. If my table <laughs> names aren't at least, <laughs> at least 100 characters long... I'm not. I'm not getting my money's worth. So, uh -huh. uh, I do. I do disagree with that. I think that you make the make the column name as long as it needs to be to correctly describe the thing that it is. And if that means it has to be 50 characters because it's a very long thing, okay. Now, you might ask, can I make this shorter? You might also ask, is this, is this database appropriately designed? Is this table appropriately designed? Is this column appropriately designed such that uh, I need to have 50 plus characters to describe what an attribute is? But sometimes, yes, that is the, the only way to do it. So um, I, I'm okay with Java naming basically. Um, names begin with a letter, not end with an underscore. Yeah, I agree with that because I, I don't like underscores. Only use letters, numbers, and underscores in names. Yeah, I agree with that, except get rid of the underscores. Um, avoid the use of multiple consecutive underscores because these can be hard to read. There's a Rob Volk session about this kind of stuff. Yeah. But, um, Very funny you, session, yeah. Oh, for sure. Use underscores where you would naturally include a space in the name. Yeah, the snake case. Um, but going back to before, no, give me camel case. I'll take camel case all day. Avoid abbreviations, and if you have to use them, make sure they're commonly understood. Yeah, I agree with that. But avoiding abbreviations can mean you're sometimes going above 30 bytes. And if you're talking really 30 bytes... All right, cool. So in any multi-language data set, now you're talking about 15 characters. Maybe you're talking uh, fewer than that, depending on the um, the language that, you know, how, how pedantic Solomon wants to be today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just picking on Solomon because I saw, I saw him in chat here. Uh, COBOL interfacing with SQL, where every column name in the database has to be unique. Oof. So yeah, the naming conventions, mm, not, not a strong, not a strong section here. Uh, tibbles, collective names. No, no, I'm strongly against collective naming. <laughs> Very pedantic. I agree. I, I could see that. Um, SSN, SSN2, SSN3. By the way, Anders, that, that actually sounds like a Fox Pro database as well. <laughs> SN46, SN47. Okay, collective names, no. Plural forms, no. Don't, don't singularize it. Uh, do not prefix with tibble, tibble or any other descriptive prefix or Hungarian notation. Yeah, this is 
awful this is awful misuse of Hungarian notation. Hungarian notation is intended to provide additional information that is not rel that is not readily available at the time of compilation. So it's intended for things like is this a secured string, meaning that I have run it through whatever regular expression checks, I've uh, run it through whatever scanners I need to, and now, now that this has been run through, it is safe to use, so I might put an, a lowercase s at the beginning to indicate I have ensured that this input is sanitized. And so that's the appropriate use of Hungarian notation. Saying s because it's a string is dumb because you define the thing as a string. You can see that in the source code. You can mouse over it in Visual Studio or Eclipse or IntelliJ IDEA or whatever tool you're using nowadays. Mouse over it and see, oh, this is a string. So that uh, form of Hungarian notation is dumb. However, I don't want to completely dismiss the idea of Hungarian notation. However, however, I don't think that really applies in the SQL world. I think that in the SQL world, if you were looking at uh, ideas of you know, sanitized strings or whatever, you might have different schemas to indicate this information rather than column names. All right, going back to chat, when you have no foreign keys, it made it fun to try to figure out like where SSN versus SSN2 versus SSN3 came from. That does sound awful. 30 bytes or even 30 characters, too restrictive, leads to abbreviations others might not quickly get and hurts maintainability. Fully agreed. Like I said, make that make that column name or that table name or whatever as long as it needs to be to be understandable. Make it clear. And I think having an arbitrary limit is a bad idea. Uh, Hugo disagrees with view naming. But he understands where it's coming from. So, what do you mean by view naming there, Mala? Hugo thinks there should be no difference between naming standards for views and tables. Hmm. So, him and I have had a little bit of a conversation around that, and I explained my reason was the same thing as what Anders is saying. I'd like to know if something is a view. And in his opinion, a view is a table as far as a query is concerned. So, it should be treated as a table. Uh, that's okay. I mean, that's just to me. I mean, he he understands the point, and he's not he's not stuck on what his views are in that regard. Yeah, no I, I would say my my general opinion is more aligned with Hugo. Um, I do think that if you don't have any overlap in names between tables and views, that especially if your views are relatively uncomplicated, where you can still insert into them or update them, then um, there's no need for it to be called VW or V whatever. There are cases where I have a table called X and I have a view that is also based on X, but is X plus additional columns. So in that case, yeah, like VX or VWX. But what what he's saying works for me, Kevin. I like to look at a query and understand if it's using a view or a table without a lot of work. Yeah, until... Until you end up with the thing called VW, my table and or my view, and then it turns out that we needed to make it a table. So, but <laughs> the code the code can't be updated. So you have a table called VW my table, and then people get confused. This is so. This is where the having characteristics of the data type or the core underlying function um, in the name can be a problem because stuff does change over time. And this is this is why I railed against that dumb form of Hungarian notation. Because if you have an integer, this is an int called i number, and then later on it becomes a long, well, either you have to change the variable name from i number to l number, or you have i number and it's really a long and now you've confused people. So either you're putting extra work on yourself because of this update and that's going to push off any updates so you may uh, delay something that needs to happen or it'll expand the scope of work of a project something that should have been a very simple change int to long and everything works changes to oh well now we have to rename hundreds of variables hope that we got everything correct 
and hope that either uh, our tools picked it up or our linter picked it up or our intern picked it up. Um, so it ends up just being additional overhead for little to no gain. Tell me you're new enough never to have coded a notepad. I have coded a notepad, um, but then I got real tools. Now I code in VI. I can't exit <laughs> VI, so I only update the one file, but you know. Um, I don't anymore, but it certainly made life easier back in the day. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> really, I don't care as long as the on statement of a join is not on the same line as the join itself. Yeah, okay, yeah, I agree. I agree with you there, Anders. Um, all right. Never give a table the same name as one of its columns. Never give a column the same name as one of its tables. I'm trying to think if there's an exception to that. Because I, I think VW underscore Beetle. Get out of here, Solomon. Um, <laughs> at least it wasn't a bus. Micro bus. Um, all right. I think that's a that's a fairly reasonable rule of thumb. There may be exceptions, but if I'm having trouble thinking of an exception um, on the fly, it's okay. Uh, avoid whenever possible concatenating two table names together to create the name of a relationship table. Rather than cars underscore mechanics prefer services. Uh, I don't no, I don't think I agree with that. And so the problem... So if it's a bridge table, if it's a bridge table, yeah. I'd actually like the two names concatenated. Yeah, exactly. Because that tells you yeah. this is a combination of this table and that table. Especially if you're in an awful system that, which doesn't have any foreign key constraints. If you have foreign key constraints, it's a little easier. But I like the name services... Why is service a combination of a car and a mechanic? Oh, well, a, a mechanic is performing a service on a car. Yeah, but what happens the next time you have another type of service? What happens if you have, like, the, the person at the front desk providing a service to a customer? Well, now I need a different services table. It Versus you could have car mechanics or um, front desk Customer, customer front desk. I I can understand the the logic behind why, but I think that it falls apart really quickly in a more complex system. As soon as you have three hundred tables that you're working on, and you're not the original developer of these things, or there's a whole series of developers, and you're not you know, the, the old hat who's been there for 15 years, then this ends up being a very good way to confuse other developers. Although then I did huh, end up with a view to a table called VW underscore Tibble name. That's, that's a whole nother ball of wax. Um, okay, columns, always use a singular name. I generally agree with that. Where possible, avoid using id as the primary identifier to the table. I, I can get behind that. Um, so I'm of two minds about this because I do like customer ID, customer ID. So if you have a customer table, its ID is customer ID. And if you have a... Uh, some other table which references customer, then it has a customer ID for and key constraint, and you can very easily link the two, and it makes sense. So in general, yes, I, I do prefer that. Thinking of this from the standpoint of a web developer or a .NET developer or you know some, some application developer, it can be more understandable to say customer.id. So you have instantiated an object called customer and you've loaded this from your table so you have customer dot id or customer dot first name customer dot last name instead of customer dot customer id and that can that can be annoying from the app dev developer side but from the data modeling side yeah i do i do prefer to have uh 
the table name included in the ID identifier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Always use lowercase except where it may not make sense, where it may make sense not to, such as proper nouns. I mean, if you're going to roll with snake case, just do all lowercase all the time. Don't don't have weird exceptions like that. Um, ID in the table is PK, table name ID on the foreign key table. Uh, so that's, that's an approach. I prefer Solomon's approach there. The table name plus ID, hence part of why table names should be singular. Yeah, it's, it all fits together. The math checks out. So yeah, I, I do prefer uh, student ID or employee ID versus ID and then employee ID on the foreign key. It's also, it is a little bit easier to do a lookup. So it's easier to see where is employee ID being used how many columns do you end up with ID in the name in the name in a table? Uh, at least one, sometimes two, three, four. When you start talking about people, they may have multiple IDs in a customer table. You know, you might have your driver's license. Uh, driver's license is a number, but you have other forms of identification that are collected, which are not the ID to which you uh, join to another table. Aliasing and correlations should relate in some way to the object. I'll buy that, I agree. As a rule of thumb, correlation name should be the first letter of each word in the object's name. I think it's a fair rule of thumb. If there's already a correlation with the same name, then append a number. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll I'll give them that. Always include the as keyword. Makes it easier to read as it is explicit. Yeah, I agree with that. For compound, or excuse me, for computed data, such as uh, the result of a, a um, aggregate function, use the name you would give it if it were a column defined in the schema. Maybe. I don't fully agree with that. Um... Yeah, I don't fully agree with that because, you know, sometimes you just have to deal with this is the expectation of what the application wants. The application needs a column called this, even though you would name it something differently. Uh, updating applications is practically impossible, as we have learned in this world. For aliasing, should always be at least I don't two like that always lowercase in column names either. Yeah, no, that's... Yeah. I mean, that, that just fits with snake case. I, I disagree with that. I prefer camel case, which naturally means I disagree with that. Um, so for aliasing, Solomon says, should always be at least two characters. Single letter aliases aren't as readable. Yeah, it depends. I think it depends on... Uh, maybe not. I'm kind of on the fence about that. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. I don't know. I I will typically single character alias, uh, especially for smaller combinations of joins. And S one now that is this is an area where I will I agree with Anders here. Um, I don't like S one and S two because S one and S two makes me read the from and join clause again. And it's real easy to get those backwards to get, especially when you have S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, S6. You, know, you basically have uh, no valuable naming. And that's where I would say, all right, call it staff. Call it, um, like even if you call it student. Or um, if you can, I guess my my... Personal rule of thumb is, if it's a table that has a unique first character in the, the query, then I'm just going to say E, like employee, dbo.employee E, join to dbo.customer C. And then I can say E and C, and it's pretty easy. For 
cases when there are multiple tables with the same starting character, then I'm going to want to be more explicit. And that may be the like EMP for employee versus ENT for entrepreneur. Something that is by itself clear enough. Mm. So, um, say so yeah, I, I don't know that there's, I don't think there's a perfect answer for that, but mm. Um, mostly preferences. Yeah, it is mostly preferences. And I, the more I look at S1 and S2 here, the more I, I disagree with that notion because you've, you've lost information in your queries. Also, the fact that uh, first name is not aliased on here is really irking me because whose first name is that? Or use an acronym for an alias if the table name is multiple words. Yeah, it, um, acronyms make a lot of sense for this. So if I have a driver's license table, it could be DL. All right. Stored procedures. Name must contain a verb. I can agree with that um, in general. Now, there are exceptions. Who is active? Is 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 a verb. But um, name must contain a verb, generally a good idea. I want to at least know what, what is this stored procedure doing. And if the answer is too vague, then it probably needs to be either multiple stored procedures or uh, broken out in some other way. Do not prefix with SP underscore or any other such descriptive prefix. Uh, definitely do not use SP underscore. It's general good advice for life, uh, with the exception being cases like SP who is active where I need to be able to run this from any database and I'm going to put that stored procedure in the master database. I'm mm -hmm. going to do that with three procedures, four procedures on a single SQL Server instance. Otherwise, your user stored procedures, anytime there's SP underscore, uh, gets, the, gets the no vote. About 15. 15 is a pretty large number. Um, I'm not saying. I'm not saying that I can't be convinced of, of 15 on an instance, and I'm sure that there is some some reason. If they're all in master and they're all useful, because hey, we've got a lot of cross database queries that run. Yeah, need to cross databases easily. I can I can see that. Uh, and I think in a lot of cases, the the number for many uh, companies is going to be closer to one, maybe two. Who is active and uh, wh whatever else you want in that list. All right, suffixes. The following suffixes have a universal meaning, ensuring the columns can be read and understood easily from SQL code. Use the correct suffix where appropriate. Who boy, we're going to see how this works out. Okay, underscore id, a unique identifier. All right, ID, I'll give you that. Uh, status, flag value or some other type of status or any type such as publication status. Status is a very broad word. Total, number, num, denotes the field contains any kind of number. So... Social security number num? Or would you just say social security num and then people say you've missed three characters? Yeah, this... The, here's the irony. So much of this is like, it's reverse Hungarian notation. You're basically saying, oh, this, this column is a number. Yes, but I can look at the data type and tell you that it's a number. Why are you telling me it's a number when I can see it's a number? <laughs> date. Yes, that's because it's stored in a date or a date time or a date time too. So a, a, lot, of, a lot of these cases I'm looking at and is saying that um, I, think, I think you just, what, what would the opposite of Hungarian notation be? I think you just created Austrian notation. All right, query syntax. 
Reserved words. Always use uppercase for reserved keywords. I agree with that. Um, use those uppercases. It is best to avoid abbreviated keywords. Use full-length ones where available. Prefer absolute to ABS. Not a compliment to Austrians. Yeah, that was that was the joke. But yeah, you know, I had to I had to go to my favorite uh, dual kingdom empire from the 19th century for uh, contrast to the Hungarians. <laughs> um, now the Austrians would be really upset that they're at the end of that chain because they were so used to being at the beginning of the chain. So maybe we should call it Austrian notation, and the other the back end would be Hungarian notation. All right. There's a Metternich joke in here somewhere. Um, who wrote the ANSI standard? Yeah, yeah. Do not use database server-specific keywords where an ANSI SQL keyword already exists performing the same function. <sighs> Again, don't, don't bother me with that. Um, once, once you have ported over three code bases, three SQL ba code bases, then talk to me. And once you talk to me about that, I mean, I'll say, wow, that sucks to be you. I'm glad I don't have to do that and continue doing what I do normally because the likelihood of me porting this code over to from SQL Server to some other code base approaches zero. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, white space. Make it easier. It's important to have correct complement of spacing. Do not crowd code or remove natural language spaces. Before we get into the specifics of white space, I will agree. I do agree. Use good white space. I hate seeing people check in SQL queries that are just an absolute mess. And I ask, does your application code look this bad? Do you like, not know the difference between tabs and spaces? Just kind of throw in various masses of them. Do you have things tabbed in and dented in and out at will, all willy-nilly? And no, of course not. I have lined up indentation. Yeah, do that for your SQL queries as well. Uh, I wouldn't consider underscore num and underscore date to be reverse Hungarian. Start date is meaningful, unlike Tibble stuff. Uh, maybe it's it's Tibble. Yeah, Tibble stuff, because that would be the, the plural instead of Tibble things. Yes, a case like a case like start date, um, sure, but I suppose some of this is that I'm now being picky and a little bit tetchy. Uh, yep. Because I I know what draws engagement. <laughs> All right. Spaces should be used to line up the code so that the root keywords all end on the same character boundary. I disagree with this so much. My head is spinning. Um, not literally spinning, just figuratively spinning. This query, the way that he has written this query, strongly disagree with it. And like, f okay, let's let's take this apart. First, you have open and close parentheses in here, which has already set things off by one space. And setting things off by that one space means everything else needs to be set off by a space. Um, the column names, why do you have two columns on the same line? The table name, where, or, or, uh, this can get pretty, once you get more complicated where That's clauses. That's just flat out dangerous. Yes. Again. Rubbish group, dangerous, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, my preference on all of this would be tab, new line. So new line tab kind of have the, the major clauses, select from, where, group by, having, order by. Have those major clauses flush left as far flush left as you can. And then tab in one stop for uh, column names. I, I used to tab, I used to put a table name on a new line and tab it in one. Um, I stopped doing that. So what is his purpose for that parenthesis, Kevin? 
Like why is why are those select statements inside? Brackets? I have no idea. Because that actually violates one of the previous statements of don't use unnecessary parentheses to combine things. Like this is this is a really bad example because those parentheses are entirely unnecessary. To me, I use that that indicates a derived table. And I'm looking for what is calling that or above that. It's really confusing. Yeah. Um, so kind of a messy query here. And right aligning these these columns, I don't, I don't agree with it at all. And there was an example up above of a join. I strongly disagree with this because, uh, first of all, join should be inner join, shouldn't just be join. So again, you violated the rule. Um, you violated specifically that rule. So why are you violating the rules in your own guide? And secondly, so once I have left outer join, I now have, like if I change this from an inner join to a left outer join, I now have to shift all the rest of my code over by that many spaces in order to realign it. Yeah, with inner join, everything would need to be one more tab out. Yeah, so uh, by changing the keyword, I now have to change the alignment. And that, to me, is an indication that you have a brittle alignment. The alignment is not a good idea. So I do like having new line tab and then have all of your select columns, one, up, one per line, from clause, uh, table name, and then tab in for inner joins and then tab in from the inner join for the on clause, especially because your on clause can be multiple lines. So strongly disagree with the way spacing is in here. Um, now I do like spacing before and after an equal sign. I like that in the sequel. In sequel. Uh, after commas, you should have this should be a new line. It shouldn't be comma space. It should be com, uh, comma new line tab Surrounding apostrophes where not within parentheses or with a trailing comma or semicolon. Um, I'm not quite sure what that means, but in this case, the, the spacing around these, I'm okay with. Line spacing. Always include new lines or a vertical space before and and or, after semicolons, after each keyword definition, after a comma when separating multiple columns into logical groups. Just strike that. Just say after a comma. Um, to separate code into related sections, keeping all keywords aligned to the right-hand side and the values left aligned creates a uniform gap down the middle of the query. This, give me a new line, tab it in one. I'm okay with it for a few columns. Um, once you start having 12 columns, I don't wanna see 12 columns across in a mess. Indentation, you follow follow standards of indentation, but not these standards. Um, joins should be indented to the other side of the river. So you want, wait. Okay, so there's inner join over here, except that up above, um, where was it? Your, your join is not indented to the other side of the river. Um, I'm liking this less and less. Like if, if you're trying to sell me that this is, this is the right way to do things, at least be consistent within your own examples. And by not being consistent within your own examples, it's just a mess. Also, the way that this is lined up, you have to have superfluous spaces and uh, you're on an and. These two clauses are indented at different levels, which make it easy for a person to accidentally miss that both of these are related to the same thing. So I, I, I prefer all of these clauses, any ons, any ands, any ors, indented to the appropriate level. And then if you have complex uh, logic, combinations of ors and ands, I definitely wanna see parentheses to group together, to bracket together those ands and ors. And uh, ideally would have new lines separating those. It's subqueries. This subquery is a mess to read. 
Um, I, I can't I can't believe that a person can look at this and say, no, this is this is absolutely the right way to write this query. <laughs> and I just I'm I'm looking at this and saying, yes, I can read the query. However, I'll bet you I can write this in a way which is easier to read. Most likely, uh, there's com there's probably going to be a common table expression involved, considering that you're using the same bit here. So you have you have a max value and you have all of the values after a date. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I I would want to rewrite that. Put five DBAs in a room, there will be at least six opinions on how best to do something. For sure, for sure. And I'll, I'll have come up with at least three of those. And depending mm -hmm. on who I'm arguing with, I'll choose one of those three. Just to make sure that I can continue being argumentative. <laughs> uh, so, basically, make use of between instead of combining multiple statements with and. I'm okay with that for numbers. I'm not okay with that for dates. Uh, the reason is between is inclusive on both sides. So between one and five, that makes sense for a human, one through five. Between January 1st and uh, January 1st of the next year is inclusive. So when we want to write a query, uh, you, you now have to say, oh, well, between January 1 and December 31 at at uh, 11.59.999999 9, 9, 9, 9 p.m. Which is dumb. When you could just say where the date is greater than January 1 and the date is less than January 1 of the next year. So, end of year. Yeah, or end of period. End of, end of whatever. I mean, that's... Uh, or even, not even end of year. Just end of whatever arbitrary period that I need it to be. Because it could be over a nine-minute interval. Um, similarly, use in instead of multiple or clauses. I'm okay with that generally. Um, when a value needs to be interpreted before leaving the database, use a case expression. Case statements can be used nested for more logical structures. Avoid union and temporary tables whenever possible. If it can be uh, optimized to remove these features, it most likely should be. I disagree with that. Avoiding the use of union. Union distinct. Yeah, most of the time I want to avoid union distinct. Avoid union all. I disagree with that. Analytical queries work pretty well with union all. Um, temporary tables. Pretty strongly disagree at a certain level. I mean, what is he just throwing out stuff like don't use this or what? Uh, I don't even know what to say. I mean, all of these things have, have very legitimate use cases. Yeah, they're, they're in the standard. They're there for a reason. Right. And temporary tables in particular, you know, there are entire classes of performance problem that you're not going to be able to solve very easily without them. Yeah. So I guess that's the where possible. Where possible is carrying a lot of water there. And in that case, I would just strike this clause altogether. Just say, ah, don't worry about it. So um, that's there's a little bit more in here, but we are pretty close to the end. Um, and I do want to talk about, since Andrew's brought this up before, let me come back over here and share screen one more time. This is an article from Lewis Davidson, came out on Friday, and another reason not to use SP underscore and SQL Server object names. So Aaron Bertrand has written a whole lot on this topic, and um, let me drop the link to Lewis's article in here. You can grab the link to Aaron's articles, uh, but what was real interesting in here was actually around um, using creator alter and some of the oddities that happen with creator alter with SP underscore procedures. So if you're in the master database and you create or alter some procedure, then everything's fine. You go to your uh, system data or your non-system database, your user database, and you say execute 
dbo.sp underscore do whatever, and it works. And then if I want to drop and recreate this procedure, if you're still in wide world importers and you create or alter procedure, this is where it gets weird and developers will be confused because it'll say this procedure does not exist. Um, so it seems like what might be happening there is that the check for create or alter is actually looking in the current database as opposed to using SP underscores magic of uh, I will first look in the master database. So it seems like there's a, a little bit of a functionality difference there in terms of how create or alter works versus how create and how alter work and how execute work. Also, if I scroll down just a little bit more, there was a drop procedure if exists. So drop procedure if exists, another thing that came out in SQL Server 2016. And this, um, again, seems to check the current database as opposed to checking the master database. So drop procedure if exists uh, will not actually drop the master procedure. So yeah, interesting article. Oh wait, no, I'm sorry. This one, yeah, yeah, drop procedure will drop the master. Drop if exists will drop the local. And this is a pretty solid reason not to put SP underscore procedures in user databases because it can lead to some confusing results once you have taught people how to use create or alter. So that was... That was a short version. Um, and we are now at the top of the hour. I would highly advise against the same procedure in a user database and master. Yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, you know, I don't wanna be the person who says never have SP underscore because yes, in the master database, uh, if you need to be able to execute it from many contexts, that is what it's useful for. But um, I don't like SP underscore databases in user databases. <laughs> I'm, I am the only one allowed to make them a master. It is nice when you have experienced the quickening. And on that note, we are going to wrap things up for tonight. So uh, no user group meeting tomorrow. Our next user group meeting will be the second Tuesday of August. We're going to get, or excuse me, of September. We are going to get those posted probably later this week and I'll uh, have them up meetup.com slash try pass and until we see each other either on another episode of shop talk or at a user group meeting everyone take care <laughs>